All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Varun. This is Brian. Uh, we work at Slack on the monitoring and observability team, and we are here to present our search engine called Astra that we built. It's a cloud-native search engine based on top of Lucene uh, uh, Open Search to name a few technologies. So this talk is going to be divided into three sections. Firstly, I'll cover what our existing log solution looks like and the problems that come with it. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about Astra and its architecture. And lastly, Brian's going to talk about our journey in building Astra, the problems we faced, the solutions we came, and the technologies we chose uh, while building this out. Here is a quick snapshot of how logging at Slack looks like. We ingest approximately 5 million messages a second, which translates over a seven-day retention window to true 2 trillion messages. We kind of handle this scale by sharding it out into 25 odd Elasticsearch clusters today, uh, with the biggest cluster containing around 1 million messages a second. So that kind of sets some context as to what we had uh, currently. Here, if anybody here has worked in log search or like field around that, this sort of a traffic pattern of log volume would look familiar to you. So what I'm sharing here is like on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we see a lot of log volume because more people are using Slack, our servers are scaled up more. So log volume kind of is highest on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And you see during off-peak hours and weekends that the traffic volume drops quite a bit. Uh, that's the blue kind of squiggly line out there. Uh, the orange line right on top, that's the line which we have provisioned our Elasticsearch clusters at, which means we can ingest logs up to that volume and it'll be able to ingest without any lag, beyond which like we kind of don't have enough capacity and things will get ingested, not in a timely manner. And the line cutting through the squiggly line, that's kind of the average. So if you take the uh, traffic pattern, pattern over the week and if you average it out, that's the line cutting right through the center. So if you kind of look at this graph, one thing that becomes obvious is between the average and the max, we kind of have a good 50% extra provision capacity which means that's like a lot of money being wasted in off-peak hours during like weekends that we don't really use. So this was one thing we kind of felt at our scale was quite a bit of money that was being left on the table. And we, with Astra, wanted to tackle this problem. So this is the first problem. Now, let's look at the second kind of problem in logging that we face when like certain services within Slack stop behaving correctly, applications start throwing lots of errors. And at that point, what you realize is the peak provision that we had kind of uh, given our Elasticsearch clusters was not enough to ingest all the logs in a timely manner. What that means is logs are delayed. And when logs are delayed, application engineers find it tough to resolve incidents in a timely manner. So tackling a problem where we are, even during bursts of scale log volume, being able to ingest these logs in a timely manner was kind of key and one of the kind of problems we wanted to tackle with Astra. This slide kind of alludes more also to the previous slide, which is the pattern of queries that we see uh, against our current logging solution. Most people are searching for logs in the last 15 minutes, in the last 30 minutes, and the number of queries against older data kind of diminish over time very, you see a big drop off. This is twofold, mostly us as engineers, what we're trying to think of is like, let me tail my logs or the sorts of tail, uh, when I'm running into issues, when my system's behaving fine, I'm kind of not looking at logs very much. The other big source of traffic 
to our logging search clusters are alerting queries. So like engineers might set alerts to say, if errors in this application go beyond a certain threshold in the last 15 minutes, send me an alert. So those are the two key query uh, queries that we see and mostly they're for like very uh, queries within the last 30 minutes or so. So being able to ingest logs in a timely manner was even more important. Thirdly, we see in Elasticsearch, the first, it, it, the schema model for Elasticsearch is essentially the first document wins, which means if I have two services, service A and service B, both are teams within Slack, they don't know about each other, they send logs and both can have a field called status. One might have it as a string, the other might have it as an integer. And the way Elasticsearch would handle it would be the first document wins. So let's say in this scenario, service A sends a doc log document first, they kind of control the schema for that index and all documents from service B get dropped. Now, since these are time-based indexes, these indexes roll over, let's say every 30 minutes. Now, after 30 minutes, it can happen that service B sends the log message first and now service B's log starts getting ingested and service A's log starts getting dropped. So this is non-deterministic. This is something that throws engineers off all the time. And this was like the third problem that we wanted to solve with Astra. So this is where we came up with this idea of adjacent architecture and how building on top of existing solutions, can we improve by building and fixing these three problems. And <clears throat> so just to recap real quick, we want to prioritize recent logs. We want to be able to dynamically scale up and down for cost reasons and for prioritizing recent logs. And we didn't want schema conflicts. So zooming back a little, this is an architecture from a Twitter search solution maybe 10 years ago called LogLens. They built out this solution. One of our engineers was very familiar with, with this solution. He presented at Berlin Buzzwords last year as well. And essentially, this was what we know 10 years back, a very interesting architecture with disambiguated storage and compute. We've seen this sort of architecture gain quite a bit of popularity over the recent years. Folks have talked about it at this conference as well. And this is an architecture we felt would solve some of our problems. And so we went with this uh, architecture that would closely model this. And this is what Astra's architecture looks like. If you see, your pro we have something called the preprocessor component. The preprocessor component essentially is in getting data from ingest sources. So think of typically Logstash. Logstash is sending data to this preprocessor component of Astra. And all the preprocessor component does here is it applies per service limits. It's doing some rate limiting and then smartly writes out this data to Kafka. So we use Kafka at this point as a transaction log. So we in Astra didn't have to build a transaction log because we said we can leverage Kafka as a write ahead log. So preprocessor does some service limits, does some data formatting and then writes it out to Kafka. Then we have this indexer component. This indexer component essentially is reading from Kafka and creating Lucene based indexes. These indexes get created over time-based manner and every, say, 30 minutes, we write out these indexes to S3. So we relied on S3 as our persistent layer storage. So every 30 minutes, these indexes get written out to S3. Think of these cache nodes on the right-hand side as our data nodes. These download data from S3 and serve queries. So essentially you have indexers and then cache nodes. All of this gets 
kind of coordinated through a cluster manager and zookeeper, which we don't really want to complicate this diagram, but that's how the coordination happens. Now, what happens when you query? Essentially, when you query, the query engine knows to get recent data from the indexers and the remaining data from the cache nodes. It does a scatter gather, it collates data and ships it out to the user. So this is in nutshell Astra's architecture. And I'm gonna leave with this one quote from LogLens, an engineer from LogLens, who mentioned some of the reasons they stopped developing log lens and how Brian now will take over and discuss how we feel what we have built won't come to the same fate as log lens and we can continue to build on top. Mm. Thank you. So yeah, I'd like to talk about some of the ways we've reused uh, existing code in building, in building our solution. And the first thing to kind of establish, right, is the relationship between Lucene and OpenSearch. So when we think about these, Lucene is the, being the core search library, right? And that's providing us stuff like our field types, tokenization, document model, right? That's all part of the, the core search library. OpenSearch is giving us a lot of these additional things you can think of when you want to run Lucene as a service, right? So uh, APIs, uh, schema management, so that includes dynamically allocating schemas, as Varun mentioned, um, changing those schemas, uh, providing a model for running this in a high availability, uh, query parsing, as well as aggregations. Um, the aggregations, I think, are especially interesting for us, right? So we think about the log use case. What we're doing is, it's very common for a, an engineer to want to look at a, um, a count of the results over time, right, of, of a particular log search, or calculate things like averages, right, so average request duration. Um, and the way we did this is we actually were able to leverage a lot of the code from OpenSearch directly. So the way this looks is we, we have a, a sort of an adapter pattern, right? We include OpenSearch as a dependency in our, our POM, and with that, we're able to run all the, the queries that come through Astra. Uh, it'll transform it in, in this adapter pattern, and that, that produces a Lucene query object out the other end. So in that case, like we're just using it to, to, to build these, these aggregations, right? And then um, if we take a look at an example uh, that might help here, we think about a, a user that wants to query our, our cluster, right? So they're, they're actually going to a, a query against the query node. As, as Varun had demonstrated there in our architecture, and that gets fanned out to all the different leaf nodes. So those would be cache nodes, indexer nodes. If we think about the, the first example, right, so a sum, uh, we see that very commonly with like a date histogram, right, over time. Uh, that's relatively straightforward, right? You just re request your leaf nodes, you ask for the sum, the query node calculates the sum and then returns it back out. Where this gets complicated, right, is we think about some other stuff that engineers want to ask, right? Was my average of this, this particular field? This is where, right, we can't just ask our leaf nodes for the average anymore. So what you end up having to do is you ask for the count and the sum, and then you recalculate that, the average at the query node layer. Uh, seems straightforward, right, but then you start running into additional complications, right? So these are floating point numbers, so you have to actually have to do something called a compensated summation or Cahan summation in the query node to address for this issue of repeatedly summing these floating points. So that's, that's the, the primary example, right, that we get the benefit we get by using open search for this logic, and, and this is an example of just sum and average. If we think about some of the additional aggregations you can do, right, so percentiles, moving averages, derivatives, right, this gets increasingly complex. Um, and this is not something that, you know, we were trying to, to, to solve. So aggregations was, was one, right, and building these requests. We're also using open search library for doing serialization. So, if we think about the representation of this, right, of these, of these aggregations from the leaf nodes back to the query nodes, right, OpenSearch has a bunch of modeling around this idea of reductions and then doing a final reduction um, when you actually need to calculate these final um, averages, for example, right? Uh, that's something that we can easily leverage uh, in this architecture. Now, this is a little bit non-standard of a use case for, for OpenSearch, right? Um, and it has required us to, to uh, do some upstream changes um, the open search folks have been great at, at accepting those uh, when we needed that, uh, primarily around you know like equals and hash code implementations that were missing stuff like that. 
And aggregations, right, like, so I get an example, right, of the of building aggregations and serialization, right, that's only one section that we're able to, to reuse from open search. Another is in, in the APIs, right, which is potentially one of the, the more valuable use cases we can think about. So if we think about running open search, right, or elastic search, there's primarily two APIs you can think about that are, are dominant. So one being for the search and one being for the ingest. Uh, the first being multi-search, right? So this is the endpoint that you're going to invoke from Kibana or Grafana uh, or, or via those tools, right? As well as internal tools. So we have internal tools at Slack uh, for some Airflow jobs that, that hit this. Uh, we have some DDoS tooling that uses this as well. Um, and what this does is, right, is this, this multi-search endpoint is a, is a deeply nested JSON object, um, and it correlates pretty closely to the, the underlying Lucene query objects. Um, not always exactly, but if you look at the, the request, right, you'll see bool, must, must not clauses in this, in this re request body. And by targeting this, this format, we're able to easily plug in our system into places that expect Elasticsearch. So the example I have here is actually our Grafana instance plugged against an Elasticsearch data source, but all we've done is we updated that, that endpoint to use our, our log search solution. Now, there are a couple additional APIs um, that we're using to, to, to make this work in Grafana specifically, right? So uh, we're taking advantage of some mapping APIs, uh, some cluster metadata to kind of enhance that. But most of it comes from this, this single multi-search endpoint. The other endpoint we see is in bulk ingest. Um, this is primarily used by Logstash, so we, we, we do currently use an Elk stack. And we have a pretty heavy use of Logstash. So I was looking last week, I believe it was in the line of range of five to 6,000 lines of, of Ruby templates um, that are defining different log stash filters across all the different clusters that we have. Um, and those are doing everything from you know, redactions, uh, JSON parsing, uh, pattern matching to extract fields out. And this was not, again, a problem we were looking to solve with, with our solution. Right? We're, we're primarily focused on cost on preventing lag, reducing the field conflicts, right? That's not something we need to address here at Logstash. So we took use of a property in Envoy. Um, for, for folks that attended the talk uh, from Reddit yesterday, this may look familiar. Um, we use Envoy heavily at Slack, uh, primarily as an egress proxy. So we already had this in place for Logstash between Logstash and Elasticsearch, where we route it through Envoy. So we're able to take advantage of shadow mirroring or this idea of, of blindly replicating the network traffic to Astra. So that's how we started off with, was just replicating the network traffic to ensure that we could handle the, the volume. And then once we were satisfied with that, we were able to promote Astra as a proper Logstash output. It is possible with Logstash to target multiple, sor or multiple syncs, um, but you have to be careful with that, right? Like when you're setting up pipelines, they're backed by queues, and then you can have issues once those, once those get exhausted. So, this is kind of the, the approach that we took when rolling out this, this approach into, into our, our pipeline. And I think that brings an interesting point, right? This idea of, of targeting these APIs for reuse, right? And I think if you look across other places that this, this pattern is used, right, I think one of the most prevalent is going to be S3. So I went through and I sat down to build a list of vendors that provide S3 compatible APIs. Um, I stopped once I had a, a complete slide. Um, this is by no means all of them. I think there's just short of, of 50 here. Uh, and all these vendors advertise some sort of S3 compatible API. Um, not all of these are cloud object storage, right, in the, in the traditional sense. But all these vendors do provide a compatible API. Um, if we look at a couple examples, right, Oracle, I know, uh, I don't believe uses the a global namespace for the bucket names, right? So that's a little bit different from, from how AWS works. Uh, I know Google Cloud Storage has some differences on their, their ACLs and their lifecycle policy management. Uh, and Backblaze, as well, I know has different requirements around bucket naming than AWS does. But even with these differences aside, right, like these vendors are, are targeting this compatible API that provides a subset of this, this functionality, right? And they're able to drive value by doing that. If I can pick on Backblaze for, for just a minute, uh, Backblaze launched initially, I believe it was in 2015, and their value proposition was that they were, at the time, a quarter of the cost, approximately, of, of AWS S3. 
And when they launched, right, they had a different API design, different structure. They had different architecture, right? They didn't, they didn't support this, this idea of a compatible API. Um, and I was actually able to find these two blog posts um, on, their, on their blog. The one on the left, again, was not, not even at launch. This was a couple years after launch, where they, they posited the, the reasons of why they did not pursue an S3-compatible API and why they thought that was not the right idea. But less than two years later, they have already launched uh, a fully compatible uh, S3 API. I guess it's not fully compatible. It's, it is a relatively high fidelity compatible API. And they kind of walked back this idea of just relying on documentation for, for adoption. I think there's a couple reasons for this, right? Like if you think about engineers that want to adopt a particular service, right? When it does provide a compatible API, the scope is well understood for that engineer going into the engagement. Um, they, may need to, they may need to do some code changes, but like they have an expectation that it will be relatively drop-in, right? Um, it's easy for them to start experimenting with this and to demo to their stakeholders, right, their, their management, uh, the value that they may be able to get out of the, the solution. And if it doesn't go well, it's easy for them to roll that back. If you think about, you know, any code changes that need to happen in a, like a mono repo or a very large repo where you have, you know, tens or hundreds of engineers committing, it can be difficult to unwind a set of commits. Um, and an API you know, allows them to experiment a little more safely. And I think that this idea of targeting these, these compatible APIs right, when building a service uh, presents some interesting opportunities. So for us, uh, that looked like integration with Kibana. So that was something that we were actually not started, we did not start to do was support Kibana. Um, we had a different idea of initially starting with Grafana data source visualizations. We had a custom, um, we still do have a custom visualization for that. The problem that we ran into was a lot of our support staff has a lot of process around Kibana, right? We have a very large support staff for, for Slack, and they have a, a documented process that, that, that leverages this. Um, our engineers also do use Kibana as well, um, and there's a, a little bit of tooling that interacts with it uh, as well. But because we had started with this idea of targeting compatible APIs at the beginning, right, it opened up this opportunity for us to pivot into supporting Kibana. And I guess more broadly, right, this idea of, of plugging something else into Kibana as a, as a data source is not new to us either. Right? That was something that uh, Uber published uh, um, some information about. In their case, they actually had, uh, I believe it was 10,000 uh, Kibana dashboards that they had in place. And they were looking at replacing their Elk stack with a custom ClickHouse implementation. So in order to avoid you know, having to, to train all their, their users to use a new system, they, they rolled out this service called a query bridge, which allowed them to dynamically control stuff like feature flag rollouts. Um, they were doing stuff like result verification, so comparing the results of their new system against the old. And they didn't aim to support again, the full breadth of the API that, that Kibana can take advantage of. It was only a subset, I believe, primarily around like, the query string. Right? So they use that to build out their, their AST for their, their ClickHouse implementation. And this is actually the, the same pattern that we used with Astra. When we rolled out, you can see cleverly named query bridge as well, um, it's a component that sits in between Kibana and Elasticsearch that allows us to incrementally roll out uh, our new log search, and it does not support the full breadth of the API, right? So we actually have an auth proxy that sits in front of Kibana, and from that we can derive information like the, the user that's requesting the logs and their, their current session ID, right? And from that we can do incremental rollouts based on that. And we also, again, did not support the full breadth of the API. We only support a subset of the aggregations from Kibana um, but we are able to power most of the, like the Explorer UI and, and a lot of the log lens use cases. Importantly for us, right, it was all the, the use case that we had for our support staff. Taking a step back, right, like this idea of exploring these incremental changes, right, these are, these are small changes that, that we've made on, on what we have now. And I think this is, this is best described in this idea of the adjacent possible. So this is an idea that was popularized uh, by Stephen Johnson in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And in it, he's actually heavily borrowing uh, an idea in, that originates in biology. 
And it's this idea that given current conditions, there are a set or finite number of things that can change. So while there are many potential, possible potential paths right, or ideas, generally it's going to be the ones that are adjacent that take hold. And some things only become obvious at that perspective. Right? So we're thinking about uh, you can see multiple steps in the future occasionally, but like as, you, as you continue down that path, it becomes more unclear. An example from tech, I think that's, that's relevant here, is Grafana. Right? So Grafana actually started off in, as a fork of Kibana uh, back in version 3, I believe it was. Um, and they were targeting this idea of simplifying this, this dashboards and panel architecture when building new dashboards. Right? That was their, their, their key concept. So in version 1, when they, when they rolled out this, this uh, new tool, right, Grafana, it still required Elasticsearch. Right? It, was just a, it was just a new front end that sat in front of that. Um, looking at their, their versions, right, like by version 2, they had written a, a custom backend that allowed them to then support uh, stuff that did not require Elasticsearch. Uh, version 3, they, looked, they rolled out a complete custom plugin system. Version 4, alerting. Right? And you guys see this, this idea where when they started, right, they started with a small idea, um, just a, a small adjacent change to what was there, right? making dashboards and the building of dashboards easier than what was in Kibana. And they didn't start off to become uh, this complete observability platform that they are today, right? And now I believe they're valued at, at around $6 billion, right? They're, they're generating value to both their, their, their shareholders as well as to engineers, right? All based on this, this small change, this small idea of something that was slightly different than what already existed. And kind of to, relating that to what we're doing with, with our project, right, in Astra, we have a couple small incremental changes on log search, some things that we think can be better about how we approach log search, um, primarily around reducing the operating cost, right? floating more on, on the actual volume that we see, um, focused on lag. right? How do we address lag and, and always provide a, a view of real-time observability to our engineers? And how do we allow them to safely operate with you know, tens or hundreds of engineers working off the same cluster um, without losing logs due to field conflicts. And in doing this, right, we, we, we looked at ways we could reuse architectures. Right? What, are, what are other solutions doing in this space? What's code that we can leverage that will help us accelerate our, our development? What are APIs, especially, that we can implement that will allow us to kickstart this? Right? And what services does that unlock us to be able to support? A lot of what we're doing with Astra is not new. right? But we believe there are these, these key ideas and these, these key areas we can focus on now to provide incremental improvements and progress on log search. To, to kind of wrap up, this, the, the title of the, the talk is based on this quote from, from Isaac Newton. And I believe as, as software engineers, right, we need to embrace more this idea that we're, we're building on top of existing concepts. Right? We're, not, we're not coming up with completely novel ideas. right? It's built on work that's come before. And we should be and can reuse code and ideas from other people right, as much as possible. This is, a, this is a natural progression, right? As we think about just small changes and increments on stuff that already exists and, and manipulating those at key boundaries, right, that, that make an interesting idea. By doing this, I think we can accelerate our work that we're developing and improve our chances of success in releasing this. Thank you. That's all I have. Questions. So, um, uh, Varun, you made a big point about the schema in the talk um, about incompatible. You know, is it a string or an int? It depends who wins first. I was really surprised. So, I, I didn't hear how Astra solves that. If it does, I was also very surprised that that would be like a driving force to switch your platform at all? Like, isn't that a matter of taming your schema, coming up with some rules, defaulting to string? I, I mean, it seems independent of a new search engine, or any search engine, for that matter. Yeah, that's a 
Good point. Uh, I can take the question to start with and then Brian can add. <clears throat> so essentially how we solved it in Astra, we basically provided like multiple ways to resolve field conflicts. So like one of the approaches say like if this field is conflicting, just drop that one field and at least ingest the remaining document, but mark that document as a field conflicted document so that you can set alerts on it or you can know that like this problem exists and this field gets dropped. Or like the second approach says like just convert it to a string or try to convert it to an int. So it does like, it has like three ways to try to resolve and it's configurable. So the least, at the very least what we wanted to do is not drop logs. So that was the primary motivation and we provide like a few ways to do that. Now, I guess to answer the broader question, if this warrants like building out this whole new thing, uh, maybe it doesn't, maybe you can solve it in different layers of the application. Like maybe someone could st solve it at the preprocessor or like at the log stash layer, or like you could have something sitting in front of all your logs that kind of data processes all of this. But it was like a nice to have feature while like the first two features were the bigger ones where engineers to resolve incidents at Slack faster makes Slack's uptime better was a bigger cause. And this was like, I guess a distant third in that. Uh, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, more? just just to add on that, right? Like one challenge that we have is we can't necessarily adopt like a strict schema. So we have several hundred engineers all using the same cluster and from the same application, right? So Slack is a monolith and it all logs to uh, primarily a, a couple of those, those clusters. So the, the screenshot that we, we showed from the field conflicts in that one cluster, right, since, since it, it was created, right, we had 4,000 or so unique fields. And it's very difficult, right, to know when the field's gonna show up. Uh, did somebody else already define it, right? Like it's, it's, it's there's a lot of collisions that we get from, from these separate teams that are, are using these clusters. So instead of, of uh, going with a strict schema, we, we went with something that was a little more permissive and uh, trying to ingest it the best we could. Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat>